Gentlemen, we're just going to usher you in. We'll just ask you to find your seats because we have another presentation to wrap up our afternoon program. Thank you. Thank you. Before we continue with Phil, we have Catherine Kunix just going to come forward and she's going to share a little bit of information with us regarding a cooking class and a couple of other items. So Catherine, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Are you full? Did you get enough to eat? Good. God is good. Um, we run a cooking class. And we had, after the last Health and Haystacks we did, uh, we ran a cooking class and it, the theme was really uh, cooking through the chaos. And as you know, prices are getting up there, you know, in the, in the grocery store. And we're looking at alternative proteins, you know, meat is skyrocketing, eggs are skyrocketing. And uh, there's some, as you're hearing from Phil, there's some really great alternatives. And we can make these taste, I think, even better. And so the last cooking class we did, uh, we focused on some legumes and lentils, but we, in, in a, a very limited capacity. This next one, we, we uh, ran a survey, and the, one of the things that came back was legumes. We'd really like to know how to cook beans properly so they don't blow you to the moon, and, <laughs> and you know, and to make them taste good. And we've got a, a course, actually, put together now, so we're going to have sort of a beans as an appetizer, then as a main, uh, we've got a few different uh, main dishes. We even have a bean dessert that uh, I think will surprise you, and it's really, it's really fun, really good. And so that's gonna be March 12th. If you would, uh, I think 2 to 4 p.m., so that's a Sunday, 2 to 4 p.m. If you're interested, please sign up, and we will send you the information, the, the official poster. Um, if you're not, just pass the clipboard along. So I'll start this over here. So I'll stand there. Thank you. Now, we're doing a few natural remedies this afternoon, and Phil will be talking, I think, some more on um, digestion and things like that. So uh, one of the things that we thought we would address is uh, peptic ulcers. Peptic ulcers, uh, they actually... <laughs> They affect, what is it, 10 to 15% of us. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of people, and it's very painful. And so Emily is actually going to talk about some cures for peptic ulcers, and we're going to run a little video. She will then speak, and then we're going to give you a little sample. Okay, roll the video. show you how to juice a cabbage. It's really not complicated, but if you haven't juiced anything before, this might be helpful to you. First of all, you're going to take your cabbage, make sure it's nicely washed, and you're going to cut them into little segments to fit into your juicer. Of course, you're going to keep your stem intact. And you're just going to cut some wedges, just like so. And you just cut up your, your cabbage like this. This actually will fit my juicer. I just have a Breville. I used to have a juicer that uh, took out a lot more of the, the juice and, and left the pulp drier, but I had to cut them into such small pieces that it took me forever to juice. But this one, I can just, you'll see, I can juice half a cabbage here in a nanosecond. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna turn it on.
I would say about a third of this cabbage. And I would say I have about two thirds to three quarters of a cup. I should actually just grab a cup here. And this is the lovely cabbage juice, as you see. Mmm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, cheers. <laughs> Why on, whoa, that turned on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Have you enjoyed the meeting so far? Wonderful. Cabbage juice. Why on earth are we drinking it? <laughs> I don't, how many of you have ever tried cabbage juice before? First of all, let's start there. Oh, I got a couple of hands. That's good. I had not tried it the other day. I had it, and it was actually not as bad as I thought it'd be. So we're handing out some samples. Please give it a try. And I'm going to just talk about some of the benefits that you can use it, especially for digestion. This applies for, um, again, any peptic ulcers. This is for colitis. This is for um, H. pylori, to my knowledge. All these different things. So honestly, if you have friends that struggle with this or you just want to aid your digestive system, this is for you. So cabbage and other several, or several other leafy greens like broccoli and kale in that kind of same family, including celery as well, have something called the anti-gizzard erosion factor, which we don't call nowadays. <laughs> we don't have gizzards. But um, it is now called vitamin U. How many of you have heard of vitamin U before? Oh, just a couple hands. I, you know, it was kind of, I think, more recently discovered, hasn't it? Or at least renamed. And uh, that's the factor that's found specifically in the juice of cabbage that has been able to aid in um, digestion. It helps with anti-inflammatory and it heals specifically wounds with your um, ulcers or your digestional tract. Now, there's actually been some stuff. <laughs> I'm hearing a couple moans. <laughs> Good job. I'm so proud of you. You're brave. Okay. There was a couple studies done. There was um, 62 patients were given at least a liter of cabbage juice daily. The average healing time for seven patients with dual denal ulcers was 10 and a half days compared to the 37 days with patients on conventional treatments. That is crazy. And then there was another one done uh, with six patients with gastric ulcers, and they healed in only 7.3 days compared to the 42 days on conventional treatments. That is amazing. So honestly, this is an amazing um, therapy. Now, a couple steps to making some cabbage juice to help your digestion is it must be freshly squeezed, not boiled. That's why um, actually my mom, Catherine, used the juicer, hence you're getting all that vitamin U factor. It's not boiled out. Now, we were kind to you. That's not all cabbage juice. That was a little bit of celery. You can put in carrot, I've heard as well. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> the, proportion <laughs> the proportions would be about 75% cap cabbage juice to about 25% either celery or you can do carrot. I recommend the celery because it also has vitamin U in it, and then you're kind of supplementing in that regard. Now, uh, oh, carrot. You can add carrot. Carrot is lovely juiced. It's delicious. So if you want a bit sweeter, um, that would be the way to go. Um, just, I don't know if anyone here has a sensitive stomach. I sometimes do, and I found it gets a little spicy over time. So if in bigger amounts, it could be a little spicy, depending on the stomach. It will not burn you, though. Now, you might also be wondering, Cass, like, or like my mom had said, it'll blow you to the moon. <laughs> um, usually in those quantities, you may develop some bloating in the first couple days, but usually it's very rare if it does. So that's good news. It won't do that to you. Now, um, what was, how much should we be taking? That's a great question. How can we get the efficacy level out of this? So it's recommended um, either from four to eight ounces of cabbage juice three times a day, 15 minutes per your, or before your meal. And that's to prep your stomach almost for your meal in a sense. And it just has the juice. You don't want other food in there, otherwise your stomach's still working on the other meal. You want to have a nice empty stomach when you take this. Um, Eight ounces is almost a cup of juice. That seems like a lot to me, so if you're brave enough to take that much, that's great. But four ounces would work just as effectively. And like I said, you're taking that three times a day. Um, now, a couple ways to aid um, using the cabbage is, like Phil was talking earlier today, you want to have that lifestyle that goes along with that if you're wanting to aid your digestion. So a couple things you could do is, um, first of all, avoid 
avoid dairy. That only stresses the stomach out. You're, you're adding more acid, or your stomach's adding more acid to your digestion and only increases peptic ulcers or um, any other inflammation. Same with um, meat products. Those are stressful on the stomach. So it could be avoided, especially if you're dealing with ulcers. Avoiding that would be great. And same with sugar and caffeine. Caffeine is a, a stimulant, and it often stays in the stomach a lot longer than um, you want it to. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of the benefits of cabbage juice. I'm very proud of you all for trying it. Hopefully you try it a couple more times at home. Do I have any questions before I give the time over to Clarissa? Yeah. Yes, great question. Yes, you should only be using green cabbage. I believe it has more of the vitamin U factor. Is that correct? Yeah. So that, to my knowledge, it should be green cabbage. Yes. Yeah, so four ounces would be like a half a cup of cabbage juice. And eight ounces, that would be, I think, the max. I don't think you could hurt yourself with more, but that would be what they recommend, and that's a cup of cabbage juice. Yes? Not as well, no. You would want to use green cabbage. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> I, I was going to say... You, you, yeah, it's stuff, you know, I wouldn't, well, I guess you could do something with it. I don't know if it'd have all the flavor because you just juiced out all the good stuff, all the minerals and everything else. But honestly, most times I give it to my chickens, but <laughs> I figure they love cabbage, so that's great for them. Yep, soup would be great. Sorry? Yes, yes, you could use that as a thickener. That's actually a neat idea. Yeah, for sure. Keep all that goodness. Wonderful. I will give the time to Clarissa. Thank you. Okay, if you could have the first slide there, please. Is there a handheld mic? Or no? Yep. Oh, yep. Okay, thank you. You could touch it again for me, if you would. And one more. Good, right there. That's great. So, uh, just one little thank you very much for that cabbage juice demo. Excellent, perfectly well done. You can make 36 ounces at a time. So in other words, you can make enough for three days at a time so that you can make it ahead. Don't make it more than that. It gets really sour and really ugly. And, you know, so even if you keep, you keep it in your fridge so you can make three days supply if you've got um, a situation that you're trying to work with, colitis or, or ulcer or whatever it is like that. Okay, so you remember we talked about the three macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, right? How much of the, of, of the uh, carbohydrate does your body absorb? How much of the protein does the body absorb? Well, how much of the fat does it absorb? Well, you know, it absorbs all the fat, right? It doesn't matter if you eat fat, it, it's right there. You got it right away, okay? Well, it's a bit of a, show them the next slide, please. They, it's really a, a kind of not a trick question, but it's a question, because our body doesn't absorb protein, it doesn't absorb carbohydrate, and it doesn't absorb fat. What it does is it breaks the, car the proteins down to amino acids, it br breaks the carbohydrates down to monosaccharides. Most common one would be glucose, and it breaks the fats down into fatty acids and glycerol, and it absorbs those things. And what is the system that does that? What is the, what is the, the, the part of the body that does the breaking it down? What do we call that system? What is it called? Anybody? Digestion, digestion right? Your digestive system. And if we were to take your digestive system out and lay it on the ground, how big would it be? How long would it be? What would be the length of it? Any idea? It would be 30 feet long. You'd have a 30-foot long digestive tract. If you were to take your body and multiply it up to the size of a horse's, your digestive tract would be exactly twice the size of his. And so in other words, we have a very complex digestive tract. You know, and it's important because we, a lot of times people talk about food. You know, we talk about, okay, we've got to eat the right food. It's got to be veg vegetables and this and that. Well, it, I, what I want to talk to you about this afternoon isn't just the food, but the system that digests the food. That, that's the system we want to concentrate on. Because you could have the perfect food, if you're eating it incorrectly, you may not get the value or get as good a value out of it, okay? So it's understanding how that, that system, where does that digestion all begin? Where does it start? Okay, right in your mouth. So I want you to help me out. Let's make up a meal. Uh, we just had a terrific meal, and thank you to the, to the cooks for making that. It was delicious. It was very fresh. tasted really good. Beans were great. But let's make up a meal. I'll just have some of you help me out. Uh, somebody come up with an entree. Who would, who, who, give me an entree, any entree. Help me out. Speak it up. 
Pizza? That's one of the four food groups. There we go. Okay, so pizza. Good. Okay, we got pizza. What next? What, anybody else? Entree. That's it? We're out. We're running out of ideas right away? Anything else? What would you like to have something cooked? Don't, don't think, okay, that guy's, you know, he's got to be, it's got to be healthy. I, I just give me something to eat, please. I'm going to starve. I got pizza. Anything else? Any, anybody like lasagna? How about lasagna? How about spaghetti? How about, come on, keep going. Okay, you got one. Cool. What is it? Oh. Pierogies, good. I love it. Okay, pierogies. So we got to have borscht too, right? Okay, we have pierogies and borscht, pizza and lasagna. What else we got? Anything else? That's it. We're out of cool. What did you hear? Steak. steak. Okay, we got steak. Good. Okay, what do you got? Noodles. Okay, great. On. What do you want on them? Stir fry. Stir fry. Good. Oh boy, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, what do we got? Have we got anything for a salad? Anybody got a salad? We got a Greek salad. We got a, you know, anybody like Greek salad? No, Greek salad. Yeah, okay, we got a Greek salad. Have we got, an, have we got a dessert? Anybody want a dessert? Nobody has a dessert here. Ice cream, good. What else? Truffles? Something? What kind? What kind of pie? Cherry pie. Cherry pie. Wow, okay, cherry pie. We got a cherry pie and ice cream. Yes, go ahead. Chocolate cake. Wow, okay, there you go. You better watch out, Mom. He's going to give away all the secrets. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Then we come home. We out, went, went out for a long, long walk. We came home, and on the table, there we have it, right? We have the, we have the pizza, and we have the steak, and we have the lasagna, and the, what was else? It was a couple other entrees. We had pierogies, and we had the spaghetti, and oh, boy, it's all laid out there. Just delicious, right? And then we also have the the Greek salad, a couple of salads, maybe Caesar salad. We got salads all laid out there. And then we have the cherry pie and we have the chocolate cake. It's all, whoa, whoa. And you see it, what happens? Saliva. Saliva. You didn't taste it at all. So digestion does not start here. Where does it start? Right here. That's really important. I want you to understand this. This is absolutely essential to understand where digestion begins because it does not start in your mouth. It starts in your mind. Have you ever been to a restaurant at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? You know, it's when you walk in the restaurant, the place is empty. Nobody goes at 5 o'clock to a restaurant. You go to a restaurant, you were there, you went and walk in the restaurant, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Not a soul in there. And the guy's standing there, he's got himself a, a, a table and a pen in his hand. He says, do you have a reservation? Like, do I need a reservation? The place is empty. Like, you don't need a reservation here. But if he asks you that, you pay for that. Because that's part of the ambiance, right? So he's giving you, well, you're important if you've, got a re you know, if you've got a reservation. If you go to the table and the table's got a linen cloth on it, you're going to pay for that. You know, they have those little candles on the table. You know, sometimes they're lit and sometimes they're not. If they're not lit, you sit down and, they, and the waiter has to come over and light the candle for you. You're going to pay for that. That's part of, the, you're being treated, you know, see, that's all part of the ambiance. The same thing goes at your own table, you know. Eat this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, if you have the table set and the, you know, the napkin beside it with the silverware on it, you're only by yourself. You're living by yourself. You could just eat between the, you know, the fridge and the stove and the pot in your hand, and you could just kind of eat going back and forth. That's not how digestion works, are you with me? That's not how it works. It works when you serve it and you sit down and you look at it because digestion starts in your mind and how it's presented is, ladies, you know, when you're making a meal, put some garnish on it, put some color, different colors on the plate. If you're by yourself, doesn't matter, do the same thing. It's your digestion, right? And you, when you eat, it, you know, what it looks like is important. How, it, how it's presented is important. And you are important. You are an important person. And treat yourself that way. Treat yourself as though you're somebody that should be looked after. I want you to think about that for a minute. Treat yourself as though you're somebody that should be taken care of. When you begin to treat yourself that way, guess what? I think, I think the Bible says that when you treat yourself that way, then you treat other people that way. Isn't that what happens? I mean, you treat others as you are, love yourself. Isn't that what it's like? You know, so it's an important person. Okay, so here we are. So digestion begins in the mind. That's where it starts. Uh, let me see. Okay, so let's take the first thought. If the food eaten, uh, yeah, go ahead. You can take the, yeah, if the food eaten is not relished, the body will not be so well nourished. You know, as soon as uh, people hear about health, eat healthy eating, what do, you, what do you think about? Something that's tasteless, 
Some of you couldn't look for, you don't even look forward to it. Like, oh boy, you know, you know I have to eat that again? <laughs> Can't wait till I get out of here. <laughs> like I tell people, you know. It, it, if the food eaten, what does it mean by, what's the word relished mean? Food eaten is, is not relished. When, when, when do you think about, what does that word relished mean? If it's not looked forward to, right? Oh, I got to tell you this story. So we, my, we were invited, we, had a, we have met this fellow, and he owned an orchard, a grape orchard down in, in Kelowna. One of the largest grape orchards in the area, and he, his name was Mr. Stewart, and he invited us. He said, when, you know, when the grape harvest is over, I'll give you a call. You can come down and pick all the grapes you want, anywhere, any kind you want. So he gave us the call, and we showed up at dinner time, lunchtime with the kids. We showed up and parked the car, and we thought, well, before we eat lunch, let's just go look at some grapes, see what they're like. I mean, you know, you're kind of curious to see what he left you there. And so the kids ran off in this direction, this direction, this direction, and pretty soon, Dad, they're over here. And you come over there, there's a great big bunch of green grapes, you know, and they're all so ripe, they're just dropping on the ground. And then you go to another bunch, and these bunches are big, like this purple grapes, and then blue grapes, and red grapes. Oh, it was just, oh, we just ate and ate. It was hot sun. I don't know, maybe they were over a little ripe. I don't know, but anyway, we were laughing and laughing and laughing. And, laughing. and we said, you know, we had eaten, we had eaten all kinds of Grape stuff, grape jelly, grape jam. We had grape ice cream. We had grape licorice. We had, I mean, we had every kind of grape juice, everything. Nothing was like that. Absolutely nothing was like that. I mean, you couldn't stop eating. It was just so delicious. If the food eaten is not relished, the body will not be so well nourished. Understand? It's important that you, you know, when you first change your diet, it's not always easy to get it the way you want it, right? But keep working on it. It's got to taste good. It, it, it's not, you can't just trick your brain into eating something that's ugly. You just can't do it. I mean, it doesn't work. You've got to keep working on it to get it so it tastes good, okay? So, okay, the next one is this one. Uh, yeah, those who are excited, anxious, or in a hurry would do well not to eat until they have found rest for, or relief for the vital powers already severely taxed cannot supply the necessary digestive fluids. Those who are excited, anxious, or in a hurry, no one in this room is in a hurry, I'm sure, but you guys are all laid back people. You know, you never sit in your car eating while you're driving, you know, rushing along trying to get this done. And you never, I'm sure you never just sit there and watching the news or trying to answer your letters on your, you know, email while you're eating. I mean, you never do any of that. You just sit down and eat, right? Wouldn't that be nice? See, those are excited. What does it mean, excited, anxious, or in a hurry? I mean, what does it mean being in a hurry? You have to understand that your digestive juices don't flow when you're excited, anxious, or in a hurry. That's what happens. The fact is, they had a test. I've got to tell you about this test. This was a lie, de lie test, lie detector test they had in England. And what they would, this, is, this is medieval times, and so they would, they, they, what they do is they'd, they'd heat up a piece of metal, red hot, and then they would have you stick out your tongue. Where are you in Enderby on Saturday, you know, at such and such a date? Were you in that, in that church, you know? And if you said no, you stick out your tongue, and they touch that piece of metal to your tongue, the theory was that if you were stressed, your saliva wouldn't be there. You wouldn't have any saliva. The saliva would be dried up because you were stressed. It, what happens is your mouth gets dry. Well, that's why public speakers, they bring them water all the time. It's very stressful public speaking. So you got to, you know. And so the theory was that, you know, if they touch your tongue, if you were lying, your tongue would be dry. So stress, anxious, in a hurry, you know, that's not a time to eat. Slow down, stop, eat. All of your body's health is dependent on your, on your digestive tract, the nutrition that you get from your digestive tract. you got to, okay, so slow down. I always thought, though, when I heard that, if I saw a guy on the other end of the room with a, you know, hood on, dark hood on, heating up a piece of metal, my mouth would go dry. I don't care whether I was telling the truth. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no wonder the guillotine was always busy, you know, chop, chop, chop. <laughs> Less population. Anyway, here we go. At mealtime. At mealtime, do not be hurried, but eat slowly with cheerfulness, and cheerfulness, your heart filled with gratitude to all of his blessings, to God for all of his blessings. You know, it used to be at one time, people, when they stopped to eat, they would have a prayer, be thankful. You know, just take a minute, be thankful. Thank God for, you know, being alive. Being, that's, that's, you know, another, another thought was cast off all care. How do you cast off all care? How do you do that? I tell people, put a five-gallon pail beside the table and just go like this, you know. We're going to enjoy this meal. We're going to have a great We're going to enjoy this, right? Cast out. Don't take out your visa bill and try and justify it at the table like this. <laughs> what?
what's a restocking fee? Tell me what that is. I mean, what, what do you mean? There's a restocking fee. I never got this fee. Unstocking fee would give me a, a surplus. They never give me money back when they unstock. It's always restocking fee. Always, the visa car is never lower than what you expected, is it? I mean, it's like, you know, to, oh, look at this. It's really low. No. Don't take, <laughs> take the time to relax and enjoy your food. Are you with me? Now, here's the problem. You decided you want to eat healthfully. You sit down at the table and you start digging into this and it tastes good. Oh, does it ever taste good? This tastes terrific. This tastes fabulous. I wonder what's in this stuff. You go in the kitchen, you pick up the label and you look. Polyscorbate 90. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this looks like something they put in a dry cleaner fluid. What is this stuff here? You know, and all of a sudden you get a tightness in your stomach. Ugh, I better not eat this, right? Look at, look at the label in the store. And if you fail to do that, look at the label in the kitchen. When you're sitting at the table, don't look at the label. Yeah, are you with me? Don't get uptight about your food. If you get uptight about it, it will harm you. It definitely will harm you. You'll become harmed by it. Be careful when you buy it. Be careful when you cook it. But when you eat it, enjoy it. Put that away. Cast off all care, okay? All right, so let's get, we're going to get into digestion here now. This is not meant to look like anybody here, so you can relax a bit. <laughs> okay, here we go. So you've, you, uh, you've made the food taste delicious. What are the three things that happen in your mouth? What are the three things that take place in your mouth? Saliva. Saliva. What else? Chewing, good, good. And one last, one last thing, what is it? Tasting, right? Uh, okay, so how important is saliva? How important is it? Very important, okay, so, all right, let's, let's talk about it. Uh, how does the food, you have a 30 foot long digestive tract, how does the food move in the di di digestive tract? How does it move along? What, is it, what makes it move along? Peristalsis, great, okay. So that means that it, the muscles contract and they push the food along. And, and now here's, here's what they do. They, they, what they did, they take, they've taken, what is it that makes that peristalsis happen? So they, some people say it's your brain. Well, they took guinea pigs and they actually cut the nerve that goes from the brain to the digestive tract, put a bean in its mouth, and it goes through the digestive tract. Just like that. So without any nerve connection to the brain, just putting a bean in that digestive tract, and that bean will go along through that guinea pig's stomach, uh, through his intestine, without any connection to the brain at all. The story I read is said that it did it for seven hours. So for seven hours, they put the bean in the mouth, and it went through for seven hours. And I thought, well, why wasn't it seven hours and 15 minutes, or seven hours and, like, 25 minutes, or seven and a half? I mean, why, why was it just seven hours? And I thought, well, that's a shift. That's a guy's shift, and when his shift was over, who knows how long it would do it, but at least it did it for seven hours. So without any connect contact at all with the brain, the peristalsis takes place. And the trigger is the wall of the intestine itself. So the contents, when they touch the wall, that's what creates the peristalsis. Isn't that neat? You can imagine jello, you know. <laughs> Not much contact there, right? You can see with food without fiber, and there's not much of a trigger. The more fiber, the better the trigger, the better the peristalsis, the better the move, food moves through. You see the importance of that? All right. Guess what? They put saliva into the person's intestinal wall, and it creates peristalsis. Saliva itself creates peristalsis. So can you make more, more saliva at the meal or less? How could you make more? How, how could you make more saliva? Chewing your food, right? And not being, not being in a hurry or anxious. Remember, it says it dries out your mouth, it, you know, stress. So, it, so more saliva is better, right? What about take a drink, take a bite, take a drink? When we were kids, my mom used to make pink lemonade, and we would take a bite, take a drink, take a bite. And our mom would say, stop washing your food. Have you ever heard that? Stop washing your food down. You don't need a lot of fluid with your meal, in other words. You don't need a lot. Of, you don't need to drink a lot with your meal, right? You, you chew your food, then you get more saliva. It's better for you, all right? All right. What about chewing? How important is chewing? What's that? Yeah. 
So how many of you grow in garden peas? Anybody here grow peas? Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you stake them? Do you stake them up? Yeah, you have to, right? If you don't stake them up, when they, the peas get on the ground, they get bad. You have to stake them up. So you just grow your peas, you stake them up. And then you have to pick them. You know, if you're going to gen genetically modify anything, why don't they modify peas so they're red instead of green? I can't find them. I mean, they're in the book. I go and pick a whole row of peas. My wife comes behind me and says, you didn't pick these. I said, I picked them. She says, look, there's a whole bunch more. And she finds a whole bunch more. They should have them genetically modified so they're red. I can find them. They're all green, the same as a plant. Anyway, so you pick them, you shell them, you blanch them, you freeze them, you take them out, and you cook them with, cor with, with, with uh, carrots, and you don't chew them. What happens? Whole peas, right through, right? <laughs> <laughs> Safeway loves you. Come on back. He's not chewing his food. Come on. <laughs> whole chunks of banana, whole chunks of cash, half a cashew, you know, whole chunks of corn going right through. You're not chewing it. There's no, the, the, your stomach has no teeth. If you don't chew it here, you don't digest it here. Are you with me? So chewing is absolutely essential. We have a dentist here. He tell you, chewing is important. Chew your food. All right? Now here's the other point. Satisfaction of appetite depends more on the length of time you chew your food than the amount that arrives in your stomach. Now I want you to get this point. Satis satiety. Some people think I can never get satisfied. <laughs> I can eat and eat and eat. S satiety, satisfaction of appetite depends more on the length of time you chew your food than on the amount that arrives in your stomach. You know, sometimes we say we're going to go to a Thanksgiving dinner and we're going to eat until we're full. What do you, I'm, I'm just going to eat until I'm full. And we put on a pair of stretch pants, and then we got a moving target, right? And it just, <laughs> just <laughs> never ending, right? Chewing, satisfaction of appetite depends more on the length of time you chew your food. Chew your food up. Okay, the next one is taste. Now, how important is taste? Very important, right? We said to that. If the food eaten is not relished, the body will not be so well nourished. Taste is important. Now, let me tell you this. This is a really important thing to understand. In all natural food, there's a natural gag reflex. Okay? What does that mean? Okay, so supposing I gave you a, a, a piece of uh, Silver Hills bread, one of those heavy, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, uh, squirrely bread. Squirrely bread, right? Gave you a whole loaf of it. I gave you a whole loaf of Wonder Bread. You can have the topping you want. Any topping. What would you like for a topping? Help me out. Has anybody got... Don't let that little... What's that? Sriracha. Vodka? Sriracha. Uh, what, oh, Sriracha. Okay. Okay. Sriracha. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Peanut butter. Okay. Got to have peanut butter. Anybody else? Apple sauce. Great. Okay. Here we go. We got some good... Avocado. Oh, wow. There we go. Wow, that's really good. That's tasty. Okay, so we got avocado. We got Soraka. We got applesauce. We got peanut butter. We got, wait, we got, all, we got all the variety. All right, I'm going to give you two loaves of bread. You can eat as many slices as you want. Which one will you eat more slices of with your favorite topping, the white bread or Silver Hill's quantity of slices? Which one will you eat more of? The white bread. There's no, there's no gag reflex. You just keep eating and eating and eating. There's nothing there, right? Okay, let's try this one on dates. You've heard of medulla dates, right? They, they, these are the ones that come up from California. They come in a ring and you taste, oh, they're sticky and they're delicious. Oh, they're just, they, they're absolutely to die for it. Somebody comes in with a fresh package. It just came in from California. Just picked, just put, not dried out, beautiful. You just pass them around. Everybody has a date. Have another date. Have another date. Have four dates. Boy, these things are rich. These are filling. Man, they, I get four dates and I'm full, right? All right, the next day we have Purdy's chocolates, all right? There's no, there's no Silver Hills food police. Nobody is around, you know. <laughs> Nobody's eyebrows are going up. You can have as many as you want. You got, you, know, you got the kind with the map on the top. You know, the hatch means the toffees and the swirls means the creams. You know, you got the whole thing. And you can eat as many as you want, right? Which one will you eat more of before you reach satiety? Well, you'll eat way more chocolates than you will dates. The date's got a natural gag reflex. You eat six dates and you're... Well, you, gotta, you get the award. Nobody else could do that. Six dates. So if you, the more natural you eat your food, the easier it is to reach satiety. Are you with me? That makes sense? Okay, here's one more problem. It's called a potluck. <laughs> this, is, this is not a potluck. This was delicious. This was not a potluck. I went to a potluck 
in, uh, on the northern end of Vancouver Island, the Port Artie. And I'm sure these ladies, their husbands are out fishing and they're, they're learning to cook. They're, they're practicing their, because these, all, all these gals were all like unbelievable cooks, right? And they had, a, they had a potluck table that was the length of the gymnasium. Four by eight sheets, the full length of the gymnasium. If you took a teaspoon off of every, every plate, you'd had to go through three times at least. It was loaded. All right, now here, let me do a thought process with me. Supposing you went to that potluck and you said, okay, I like to have some of the mashed potatoes. So I take the mashed potatoes. I like the walnut patty. I take the walnut patty. And I like the corn. I'll have some of the corn. I sat down and eat that. And I go back. I'm still a little hungry. So I take some more of the mashed potatoes. I take some more of the walnut patty and some more of the corn. Well, I have a little corner left. So I take some more mashed potatoes, some more walnut patty, and some corn. What's going to happen? I've had it. I've had enough corn, mashed potatoes, and walnut patty. I don't want any more. But if I took a teaspoon from every plate, I'd never finish. I, 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 can't, I can't get enough of anything to get full. Are you with me? I just stuffed, but I'm not full. So here's the point. First of all, number one point, do not stop going to potlucks. That's a really important thing. You have a social nature, every person in this room, you have a social nature, and it is absolutely essential for you to get together with other people. It is essential. Do not stop going to potlucks. I don't care if you stuff yourself, just keep going to potlucks. It's only once in a while. You need fellowship. You need to be with other people. It's an absolutely essential for every person in this room to have friends, to make friends, to enjoy their food, to share food with them. That's absolutely essential. But at home, every meal doesn't have to be a potluck. See what I'm saying? You could have lots of variety throughout the week, but not a whole lot of variety at every meal. Less variety at the meal, you'll get satiety much quicker. You'll reach satiety. So less variety, but lots of variety throughout the week. Okay, so here we are. We've done it right. Well, you have to do that. Yeah, otherwise no more baptisms for you. Okay, here we go. So we have the, the person has done everything right. They swallowed the food. It goes down into your stomach. The stomach has a door at the top and a door at the bottom. Why? There's a door at the top of the stomach and a door at the bottom. What, what if the, bo the door at the top of the stomach doesn't work? What happens? What's the problem? What, what does that create? What's the problem it creates? Acid reflux. That's right. And hiatus hernia and scarring of the esophagus. You have a door. Why? What's going on in the stomach? What's taking place? Why, why does it have a doorway at the top and the bottom? It's really important to understand this. Why? What's inside the stomach? Okay, HCL. If you, had, if you have the alkaline acid uh, chart, as alkaline as you can get it is 14, as acid as you can get it is 1. The blood is running at 7.4. 14 is as alkaline as you can get it on the alkaline acid chart, and 1 is as acid as you can get it, and your HCL is as acid as you can get it. Anybody here that's had acid reflux know if you've got wallpaper on the wall you want to get rid of, just go over. <sighs> it's hot. It's, it's potent, right? I mean, it's really something. Hydrochloric acid, and it's there for a reason because that's where you take your protein apart. You have your body has pepsin inside that hydrochloric acid that's ripping the amines off, and you have to take those amino acids apart Oh, this is fantastic. Think about this. You're living with this wife. I've lived with my wife for 50 years. We're eating out of the same garden, 50 years. Same potatoes, same beets, same onions. She's making blue eyes out of it. I'm making brown eyes out of it. Same food. But her body takes it apart to the amino acids and builds it according to her genetic code, and my body builds it according to my genetic code. And if I needed a kidney and she matched and she gave me a kidney, I would still have to have anti-rejection drugs because my body would say it's not my kidney. Even though we're eating exactly the same food because your body takes it apart to the amino acids and then you use the amino acids to rebuild your body according to your code. And that needs to take place in your stomach. And that's where the hydrochloric acid is. That's where it's working, right? I didn't know anything about this, this, this door at the bottom of your stomach, this pyloric valve. I didn't know anything about it until my wife, well, I'll have to tell you this story. It won't be long. We'll, do, we'll, get, we'll be out of here in, in another two hours for sure. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, here we go. 
Uh, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, we, we, we hitchhiked everywhere. Did you know that? Nobody thought about it. You, you could tell them the story. You guys were there, right? We hitchhiked everywhere. My wife hitchhiked all over the place. Never, ever, never questioned at all. You hitchhiked. You know, nobody ever thought, well, somebody's going to get hurt. Something's going to go wrong. My wife hitchhiked back and forth to town to go shopping. I went and hitchhiked to work. I mean, we, we hitchhiked everywhere. I was hitchhiking home from work, and this pickup pulls over, and I hop in, and my wife's in there. <laughs> you haven't even started to laugh yet. <laughs> when we came to a stop and we got out, she turned to me and she says, I'm pregnant. <laughs> well, which was true, because she's just coming back from the doctor. She'd been at the doctor's office and she told her she was pregnant. <laughs> no, that's not the end of the story, see. <laughs> we, were, we were in... We were in Victoria, and my dad and mom lived in Ottawa, and my wife was so excited, she wanted to phone my dad and tell her that she was pregnant, right? So we, we forgot about the three-hour difference. So she got, phoned him, it was midnight, and woke him up. And she says, Dad, I'm pregnant. He says, well, that's not hard. He says, it's a lot harder not to be pregnant. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> Then he said to her, he, she said, he says, yeah, you, you expect me to be excited? He said, I went to bed a young man, I woke up a grandpa. He says, like, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. So, uh, when she told me she was pregnant, I, 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 I have to tell you, an almost unbelievable thing came over me. Because... I had gone to school for numerous years, and it didn't do too bad. It got, the grades were good. But I couldn't remember one class on babies. <laughs> Not one. I don't remember anything about a baby at, in school at all. I don't remember ever being taught anything about a diaper or a bottle, you know, bottle or a, how to heat it or wash it or bath it or clothe it or no, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I was concerned until I heard they had a prenatal class. And I was so excited, now they're going to teach me how to be a dad. You know, so I got there and I did. I stand up here at the head and make sure I stay out of the way of what they're actually doing over here and make sure she's breathing properly. That's all. Stay right here. <laughs> so the day came. I was actually we're in Courtney and uh, we were building the priest's house right across from the hospital, right directly across. You could see the hospital. And my wife was in labor, and so I told the late the nurse, I said, when the labor gets serious, wave something out the window and I'll run across. <laughs> and so that's what I was putting, we were putting the soffits on, I kept watching, watching, finally this, you know, I ran over there and there's the baby was born. Wow, that was so exciting, and boy, baby boy. And, uh, you know, of course, I, boy, you wanted to look at him eye to eye, man to man, you know, like, good, like, and they handed me the baby and his head fell off, you know. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know they didn't have any neck muscles when they're born, right? I mean, you, you have to hold the head, right? And they, they said, get the head, so I got the head, you know, like that. <laughs> yeah. We took him home, and I don't know why they let me, but anyway. But they <laughs> We got the baby home, and I, let me tell you that the, at that time in Earth's history, there was no incentive to teach a mother to breastfeed that baby, not one. The, you took the baby home with a bottle, that was it. There was, the nurse just gave you the bottle, that was it, no, no incentive. And our baby had a little tiny problem. You would feed him, and you know how you sit him up and you kind of rub the back and just tap him gently to kind of get him to burp? Well, he would burp with what's called projectile vomiting. <laughs> Ten feet hit the wall. Wow. Like that was, like everything would come up, just bang, hit the wall. And now I got a baby that's crying, and I don't know what to do, and I got a wife that's crying, and they don't have any take back policy. It's not like Costco or Walmart, nothing. It's just like This thing's not working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, boy. Yeah, it was fortunate I looked it up. It only lasts two years, so I mean, it was <laughs> short. <laughs> At 16, he wouldn't be doing it, right? <laughs> anyway, the reason why is because this phyloric valve here was closing so rapidly, it would project all of the food that's in the stomach right out, just blow it right out. It's important for us to understand how this thing works. You can advance, I want, to, want you to carry on, and I'll tell you when to quit, because we've missed a few slides. Go ahead, advance that. Okay, uh, just click it one more time. There you go, stop there. So, what about eating between meals? What about eating between meals? I mean, you know, we, we talked about the physiology of digestion. So what, what does it mean to be eating between meals, okay? So uh, what they did is they gave a group of students a breakfast of cereal, cream, bread and butter, cooked fruit, and egg was eaten, and the stomach was empty in four hours. You want to click on that again one more time? Okay, so be after breakfast, they gave them, two hours after breakfast, they gave them an ice, ice cream cone. You can see they had a residue at six hours, a nut butter sandwich, a residue at nine hours, pumpkin pie and a glass of milk. They had residue from the breakfast at nine hours, and a banana at eight hours. Just a banana, okay? Take and click it again, please. So again, a breakfast was eaten at 8 a.m., dinner at noon, supper at 5.30, twice in the forenoon, twice in the afternoon, a chocolate candy was eaten at 9.30, more than half the breakfast was still in the stomach 13 and a half hours after the breakfast was eaten. So this person's got what you call indigestion, right? Uh, they've got fermentations taking place. They may have headaches. They may have all kinds of difficulty with uh, who knows what as far as their health goes. And it, 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 simply what's going on is that the body is not processing. You know, I, I, I liken it to this. When you've got your washing done, my wife lets me do this once in a while, not very often, but she lets me do the laundry. And I put the stuff in the laundry and I take it out of there and I put it in the dryer. And when the dryer is just about done, I take the next load, I want to take the, and when I go into the washer, once in a while I see that I was inadvertently left a sock in the washer. That's why she doesn't let me do it very often, I think. But anyway, I get the sock and I found out something about my dryer that's so neat, and that is, is if you get the door and you open it fast enough and throw the thing in quick enough and shut it, the little mind on that thing didn't, get, didn't even know you did it, and it just keeps on going. I love it. Oh, wow. I don't have to reset that whole thing, and the way it goes. The problem is, is if you throw a wet sock into a load that's almost dry, what's going to happen? Slow everything down. That's exactly what's going on with your stomach. Your stomach has a door at the top and the bottom of the stomach for a reason. And the reason is it's because it's trying to get the amines torn off to get to build your body out of those amine amines, those, those, those amino acids. That's what it's doing. And if you keep throwing socks in there, well, no, I mean, if you keep putting food in there, see what you slow it down and you're interfering it. Now, we have a tremendous rash of people that are coming to our guest house that have digestive problems, food sensitivities, allergies, all kinds of things, all kinds of, of food problems. You know, remember what I told you we used to live on the farm, remember? Most people in Canada lived on a farm at one time. You fed your cows at a certain time, you milked your cows at a certain time, you, you had a routine, you ate your meals at a certain time, you didn't snack all day long. I've had people tell me, I'm grazing. I said, have you ever watched a cow? They graze, they stop, they lay down, they burp it up, they chew it, they go through a digestive phase, then they get up and graze. They don't graze all day long. They don't do what we call grazing, right? They graze and then they stop. If you want your digestive tract to work properly, it loves to have routine. And if you're having digestive problems especially, it loves routine. It likes to have a certain time to eat a time for it to digest, a certain time to eat, a time for it to digest. That's the way it works the best, absolutely the best. Okay, here we go. So I tell the kids when I'm teaching them, the food, that's it. when you swallow your food, it's not inside your body. The food you swallow is not inside your body because the, your digestive tract is outside your body all the way through. And they look at me like, well, you know, they knew I was nuts already, right? So they just confirmed it. When I swallow it, it's inside my body, but it's not really. Because your digestive tract, the inside of your digestive tract, 
is outside your body all the way through. That only the food that's absorbed through the wall of the digestive tract goes into your body. Are you with me? Only the food. Your body is protecting you from your food. Your food is full of bacteria, loaded. I don't know how a microbiologist actually eats. You look at your food and you go like, oh, if you were to look at it on a microscope, it's crawling with bacteria. You go like, I can't eat the salad. It's just alive. It's just about walking away on me. But that digestive tract is protecting you all the way through because it has, it, it only absorbs the food that goes through the wall of it. Keeping your digestive tract as healthy is a very important part of your health. Take care of yourself. You know, we, we left the farm and we left the routine and we said it doesn't matter. We can do whatever we want, eat whatever we want, do whatever we want. And we have been suffering as a result of it. We wouldn't do it with our animals. We wouldn't feed our animal that way. We would, you know, my next door neighbor had prize pigeons. And he said, you can never raise a prize pigeon if you don't feed it on a schedule. I said, well, we're all pigeons then. Are you with me? Okay, so there you go. There's the story on, on, on digestion. We're going to show you a couple more things on some treatments. I think uh, Clarissa has got some ideas that she's going to present. Yeah, we just want to talk a little bit about charcoal. We have charcoal powder here. And it is a wonderful thing if you're having stomach problems, any indigestion. Um, the secret of charcoal's powder, charcoal powder's power is ad its adsorption. Um, it draws the poisons to it and attaches to them and so they can be carried out of the body. Um, it's not like a sponge that absorbs where you can squeeze it out. The adsorption, it, hang, it connects to those poisons and doesn't let go, takes them right out of your body. And then when you use charcoal as a remedy, um, your body doesn't, it can go right away to healing and restoration, doesn't have to deal with poisons and drugs, first of all. Um, most emergency room, hospital, hospital and emergency room, they use charcoal for overdoses and accidental poisonings, at least in the US they do. It's called a universal antidote. Um, because charcoal is nearly pure carbon, um, the risks in using it are basically non-existent. Um, there's been many studies done with animals as well as humans um, taking it regularly, even large doses, of large amounts of it, and there's been no um, traceable side effect. Um, there's no toxicity with skin, talk, skin contact or inhalation, less of course when you're stirring it up, you inhale the powder, it's very light and fluffy and it makes a big mess. If you're not really, really careful, if you inhale it, you're gonna cough and you're gonna get a black nose. And if you take too much of it without enough liquid with it, then you'll get constipated. So those are your side effects. Um, but it's great for detox, for poison control, for intestinal problems and allergic reactions. Um, my mom had a lot of food allergies and would, if she would, eat something that caused a reaction, she have like a foggy brain, um, maybe itching skin, um, she'd take a couple of capsules. You can get charcoal in capsules, in a tablet, or in powder form. The powder form is the most powerful. Um, she'd take a couple capsules with a, or whatever, either capsules or pills with a, with a glass of water and in a half hour, if she wasn't feeling better, then she'd take a couple more. And it was very effective for removing those poisons to her, you know, that were causing her body issues. Um, it helped, it helped a lot with allergic reactions. And then um, when she got older, when she was in the care home up the hill here, um, the nurses, they couldn't relate to charcoal, right? I mean, it's outdated, but it doesn't change. Um, so anyway, um, we, they couldn't relate to it as a medication, so we took powder and stirred it up in applesauce, and then it could go in her little pot in the fridge as a food, and that was okay for dealing with, because there's always, like she had corn allergy, sugar allergy, and there's like corn, cornstarch, and sugar in almost everything that they would feed them, right? Um, so that worked well, and that works well if you're trying to um, Give it to a child, too, if your child is really upset stomach um, or diarrhea or something. Um, stir, you know, make some fancy black applesauce. And, you know, put a spoonful, teaspoon of uh, 
charcoal in that applesauce, stir it up and give them some black applesauce and then give them some nice yellow applesauce afterwards to cle clear out their mouth and their tongue so they're not so black. It works really, really well and, you know, just make it really um, exciting, right? Because um, they don't maybe like to swallow pills or capsules. Um, Dr. Raymond Hall, uh, a PhD from Loma Linda University School of Medicine, had 30 volunteers study the effectiveness of charcoal, activated charcoal against intestinal gas. So he gave them all a uh, meal that was very low gas producing and then measured the intestinal gas and then gave them all um, a meal that was more gassy foods, uh, high gas foods, you know, like beans and spice and stuff. And then, um, mesh. then he gave 15 of them um, activated charcoal and 50 of them placebo and then measured the gas in their stomach. And the 15 that had the, the charcoal, um, there was no more measurable gas than when they had the low gas meal. But the ones who had the placebo had high amounts of gas in their stomach. So he says he didn't know whether the, um, whether the charcoal was absorbing the gas or the bacteria that made the gas, but either way, it worked. Um, Cloves is also highly recommended if someone has slow digestion because it promotes an increase in digestive enzymes. So you could put a few drops of clove oil in some water have after the meal and it will help. It's a good remedy for gas and indigestion and reaction to spicy foods. Um, or you can, um, there's some clove oil. Or you could chew a few fennel seeds, those help with with gas and flatulence there. Um, of course, we know ginger helps settle upset stomach as well as preventing colds and fevers and relieving pain. Um, but if you're dealing, say, with charcoal, if you have aspirin poisoning, like your child gets into the aspirin, um, give them activated charcoal right away. Um, charcoal is most, it, it reaches its absorbing level like about one minute after it gets into your stomach. So you want to, and, and aspirin is really quickly absorbed in the body, so you want to give the charcoal within a half an hour. If you give them charcoal after they've had like, oh, they had the, uh, too much aspirin like an hour ago, it's already going to be all through your body. It's only going to absorb about 10%. So you want to do that as quickly as possible. Um, but I think Phil is going to talk about treating um, serious problems um, with charcoal, right? With poultice or, or something. Um, yeah, so we can we can um, show how that's done if Dave wants to come up here. Uh, we just, oh, I forgot to tell you, another way to take charcoal is slurry. You want to be very careful with your charcoal because it's very light and fluffy. But you can just take a, a big tablespoon of this charcoal and stir it up in water. It looks very beautiful. Um, and then just let it settle out. Or you can drink the whole thing just like that if you want to. Um, but let it settle out and then just, just drink the, the liquid. It will settle out too It's till it's kind of just a little bit gray, not black like this. But there's still the, the goodness in there that will help with the digestive issues in your stomach. Um, and then the poultice. I should have brought another spoon. Um, just, we, I forgot to bring ground flaxseed because that's really good for a binder. But if you take, um, just pretend this is clear water. Um, yeah, and that's wet it's already. I should have brought two. Um, sh just be real careful. Don't be too energetic or it'll foof up. And it, it stains everything, but it, it works miracles. Everything. Yeah, you need more charcoal. So, yeah, just mix it up. Take some par powdered charcoal and water and, like, flaxseed, because flaxseed is like a gel. It'll thicken things up, and it'll keep it from running out. Because if you're going to do a poultice on infection or something like that, um, then you want it not to be running down your arms or, you know, out your whatever, making a big horrible mess. So you want it to be kind of gelled, right? And then just put it on 
You can put it on some paper towel, have some plastic wrap to contain it, and then just, um, yeah, spread it. We can put it in the middle, right? Yeah, just put a little bit on there, uh -oh, on the side. Um, this should be enough to do a lot of area. Okay. <laughs> okay. Actually, you're doing that. Maybe we shouldn't try and do this. <laughs> so, you know, like, I don't know, you're going to talk about something on the stomach, right? Yeah, which we won't do that now. But, so put it on the area, and this is way too much plastic around it, and then just use some tape, tape it on. They can imagine that, right? Yeah. Because you don't have scissors, you have a cup of tape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it draws, it, it draws out poisons. Yeah, and Phil will tell you everything else that I didn't tell you. Thank you. I'll tell you one story real fast. I went someplace and uh, some nice people, a uh, young lady had uh, some mayonnaise that had been sitting in the wrong spot for a long while and mixed it up with some good mayonnaise and we had sandwiches and then uh, uh, another guy and I, we went driving someplace and all of a sudden I had to get rid of most of my food. And um, that happened about three times till we finally got back home and um, we got home, first thing it is, I head for the charcoal and I mixed up a bunch like that and just chugged it down. And about 30 seconds later, boom, came back out. And I mixed up another batch and I chugged it down and boom, right back out. And third time was a charm, though. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with, uh, thank you very much, Clarice and uh, Dave. The uh, charcoal, what Clarice was talking about, what you do is you powder the flaxseed. So you blend it up so it's a powder. And you mix the p flaxseed powder 50-50 with your charcoal. That's for a poultice. That works really well. You use a paper towel, cover it up with plastic, and you can put it anywhere on the body where you have pain. If you have pain in the abdomen, it will work. Just put it right on the abdomen. And then, you know, and the two things you got to do is you got to make sure that you tape it well. Because when it comes off, then your bed is going to get charcoal. And it, it's, it, it comes off. It will wash out. But it just takes a lot of extra work. My first experience with making charcoal, I used to take birch and chop it up into fine sticks and then put it under, take a metal pail that I'd cut in half and flip it over top of it and build a fire over top of that and made it my own charcoal sticks. How do you make charcoal powder out of charcoal sticks? Anybody have any idea? You make sure your wife's not home. <laughs> you put it in the blender. And if you think you've got powder flying around the kitchen when you just handle it, you should see what happens when you get the blender. And then you find out you need charcoal because of all the beatings you get from, you know, anyway. <laughs> it's just, I, I subsequently decided to buy the charcoal powder. <laughs> it's just a, it just saves a lot of, a lot of marital in, in crises. Anyway, okay. You'll see I gave you a sheet there that is called the heating compress. Okay, so that's what this is that I have right here. So a lot of people have constipation. You know, their, their bowel is slow. It's not working well. And so you take a piece of cotton cloth like this, okay? So you got a piece of cotton cloth, you dip it in cold water, you put it on the abdomen. You have that person lay on their bed on, with a piece of wool that's long enough to go right around their abdomen. See, so they're laying on their back, they have the cold cotton cloth on their stomach, you pull it to the front, and you pin it in place. If a person's got insomnia, do this. Just insomnia, do this. You gotta get a nice piece of cotton cloth, get it wet, put it on their abdomen, wrap them up, and you'll find out that that may be what it takes to get rid of the insomnia. A lot of people are got insomnia because of digestive problems, and this really soothes the digestive tract. It's called the heating compress. The other thing that I don't know whether it's in your literature there, I don't know whether I handed it out to you, but I'm going to tell you about it because we use it, have used it fairly frequently, and that is the castor oil pack. A person that has uh, colitis, diverticulitis, you know, those itises, the inflammations in the digestive tract. You take, this is, this will be flannel, five thicknesses. So I folded this so it's five thicknesses. You soak it with castor oil so it doesn't drip, but it's soaking wet, all right? It's wet right through. You put it on the area where the inflammation is, the pain. You put that right on the, on the abdomen. Then you cover it with a piece of plastic. 
and then you put a heating pad on it, leave it on for 45 minutes to an hour, just on that spot where the, where the inflammation is. That will, that will reduce the inflammation process in that person's abdomen. They'll love it, especially if they've got diverticulitis or colitis or some of those inflammatory situations in the thing. That, that's, now, when you get done with this, put it in the plastic. I used a plastic, this, I used a plastic bag for covering it. Put that in the plastic bag, put it in the fridge. You use it 40 times, just keep reusing it. If it gets a little dry, dampen it again. So make it a little wet so it goes again. Okay, let's finish up with one thought and we gotta go. All right, here we go. So you have two kids, two children. Do we have any Larrys here? No Larrys? Do we have any Bobs? No Bobs, great. Okay, so we're gonna have Larry and Bob. All right. So Larry and Bob. See, so Larry's the kind of guy that likes to have breakfast. Some of our kids, they just love breakfast, get up, have breakfast. So he gets up, has his Pop-Tarts and syrup, has his breakfast, away he goes. Bob, on the other hand, he's the kid, you know, that the, the school bus is rounding the corner. He's got one shoe under his arm, he's got his backpack on, he's hobbling out to the bus, didn't have anything to eat, he didn't care about breakfast, he just went. Just wants, he wants to sleep right up to the last minute and then off to school he goes. Well, see, Bob's blood sugar is going to do one of these. He didn't have any breakfast, so it's just going to keep on going. There. But Larry had his Pop-Tarts and syrup, right? So away he goes his blood sugar. Pew. The reason for it is because he ate a very refined, sugary breakfast. And so his blood sugar is going to take right off because what we did is we took the grain or whatever it was we refined and we made them into short chain carbon molecules. All his body has to do is release these bonds and he's got a huge amount of sugar taken off. You know, Larry could be that guy that has a muffin and a cup of coffee on the way to work, same thing, it's so different. It's gonna do exactly the same thing. Blood sugar is gonna take off. At 10 o'clock, his insulin's gonna kick in and his blood sugar is gonna drop like a stone, it has to. He's gonna bring it back down or he's gonna, you know, he's gonna go into insulin, he's gonna go into shock, high sugar, and he's gonna go wipe him right out. At 10.30, Larry's blood sugar is going to be low, his, be low his brother who didn't eat at all. And if you don't give him a snack, he's going to be in trouble. In 1970, 70% of kids ate between meals. In 1980, 80% of kids ate between meals. In 1990, 90%. Year 2000, the government made a rule that if you send a kid to daycare without a snack, the daycare had to provide a snack. And this is why. Because the kid is eating a high fructose, high sugar breakfast, and their blood sugar takes off, and at 10.30, they need a snack. If you're eating a muffin and coffee on the way to work, you need a snack at 10 o'clock. I mean, it's just what, ha what happens, because your blood sugar's dropped off. What would you do to protect against that? We have guests that come that are all snackers, they have all eaten, and we have them, you know, we have them there for two weeks at a time. And I'll ask them the second week they're there, I said, do you miss your snack? And they say, no. And I say, why do you think you don't miss your snack? Because we feed you. <laughs> we get you to eat at the same time every day, and we feed you. We make you eat. Big breakfast, big lunch. You know, you eat. The way you take care of the snack habit is to eat. Just eat your meals on a regular schedule. You won't have to have a snack. It's only when you start snacking, and then it leads to more snacking and more snacking. Okay? There you go. You know, you folks have been really good. at Usually, on an afternoon after a haystack lunch, most people are falling asleep. You guys are wide awake, thank you very much. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer to close the meeting. Father in heaven, as we bow before you here this afternoon, and Lord, we, uh, wow, we just inhabit your creation. You made it, we just inhabit it, and we love it, we thank you for it. And we haven't always taken care of it, Lord. We have many times, uh, well, either ignorantly or um, not willfully, but maybe just forgetfully. We haven't taken care of what you've created, and we thank you for it. We pray that, Lord, that you'll be with each person that's here. What a sanctuary you've given us. We thank you that you have provided. We pray that you'll give us the strength, wisdom, understanding, the love to take care of it. In Jesus' worthy name, amen. Thank you, Phil. That was very good. Much appreciated.
Well, that's it for today, but a couple of little minor things. One, if you haven't signed up for the cooking class but you would like to, just put up your hand and we will find you. And the last thing is, if you want further information, if you want to know what other programs we'll be putting on in the future, just look up the Enderby Seventh-day Adventist Church on Facebook. The Facebook page will be advertising it all. So just take a look there, and the future programs will be available to anyone who wants to participate. So thank you for coming out today, and have a good afternoon. Take care.